الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتب الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته May Allah bless you and the organizers for the honor you all bestowed upon me to share a few humble thoughts with you on the issue of faith and citizenship, ummah and nation. Uh, you might have noticed there is a slight editorial to the title for good reason. It doesn't say ummah or nation, but ummah and nation. And with their permission, I'd like to add also a subtitle, Positive Civil Engagement. The topic, inshallah, will begin with a brief introduction. Then we'll talk about the ideas or concepts of nation and ummah. And of course, that would lead us to the necessity or imperative of civic engagement. We'll try to talk about the conceptual basis of civic engagement. I should say positive civic engagement. And then we'll go even to some more explicit commands in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and his Sirah to the same effect. And finally, inshallah, we hope to deal with two very sensitive and hot issues. Loyalty. Can a person be loyal to a given nation where he lives or she? And at the same time, loyal to Allah, his Prophet, and the Muslim Ummah. And finally, more explicitly even, what are the citizenship duties and rights? And I deliberately put duties even before rights because if everyone fulfills his or her duties, their rights also would be fulfilled as well. And a brief conclusion. I'm beginning basically with some basic assumption. First of all, the fact of anyone being a minority, I'm not referring only to Muslim minority, any minority does not mean that they are not equal and full citizens. Secondly, there is a difference between speaking about a Muslim minority citizens living or residing in a given country and being between the concept of full citizens. It's not only residing in a given country, they are also citizens of these countries. Thirdly, it is nothing new that Muslims are living under a situation of minority. Muslims have always lived in a minority situation throughout their 1400 years of history. And they are living today also, many Muslims, perhaps close to one third of all Muslims are living in a minority situation. So it is nothing totally new or just a response to issues that have risen relatively more recently. Now get, let's get to one of the three basic questions or issues. A nation and, not or even, a nation and ummah. What is a nation? Well, you all know that just to choose one of the definition in the new Webster dictionary. A body of people recognized as an entity by virtue of their notice, historical, linguistic, or ethnic link, or a body of people united under a particular political organization and usually occupying a defined territory. Clear enough. Is that the same like Ummah? Because some translators of the Quran translate Ummah as a nation, which I do not necessarily share. Well, first of all, let us examine the usages, not usage, usages of the term Ummah in the Quran. And these are contextual definitions, by the way. In some places in the Quran, we find that Ummah refers to all humanity, especially in the beginning of creation. As Allah says, people, not only Muslims, all people were one Ummah. That's one usage on the most macro level. Sometimes it speaks about a village, a township, 
group of townships or area in the world where a prophet was raised. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا So every ummah received a prophet. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِي قَرْيَةٍ مِنْ نَذِيرٍ Even a village. If, if that is the scope of the mission of a prophet. Thirdly, to narrow down the definition, sometimes a small group of people are called ummah. When the Quran speaks about the story of Prophet Musa السلام, when he went to Madian, what does the Quran say? When that means when he reached the wells of Madian, he found an ummah of people who are watering their flocks. Well, watering their flocks, obviously you speak about maybe a few dozen shepherds. That's also called ummah. But then there is an important definition of an ummah, which again, it's contextual, depending on what the story is or what the context of the ayah is, which refers more accurately to a global community of faith, of faith only as the basis that connect them together. Not territory, not a given political system. It transcends all other barriers that some people consider as barrier, unfortunately, like race, color, sex, ethnicity, language, economic position, social position, or any other classification for that matter. The only thing that brings them together as one community is faith. That's why the term community of faith. Now, the second issue. If indeed the issue is not living in a nation versus ummah, if it is nation and ummah in their proper context without in an inherent conflict or contradiction, then that leads us to the conclusion that civic engagement, positive civic engagement is imperative for Muslims irrespective of their majority or minority situation. Let us begin conceptually with basic values in the Quran and the teaching of Islam that implies or presumes that Muslims are not always living purely as a community of faith in a given geographic area or nations as such. First of all, the Quran makes it clear that the human beings are created to be the trustees of Allah on earth. And when the Quran speaks about it, it doesn't say Muslims in particular. It speaks about the collective responsibility of humanity, ideally, to be the trustees of Allah on earth. Of course, those who believe in Allah have greater responsibility, but it is a shared responsibility according to the text of the Quran. Whoever fulfills it, fine. Whoever doesn't fulfill it, that's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hold them accountable. But this is the role of humans, not only Muslims on earth. Secondly, the Quran speaks about the dignity of the human. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Indeed, we ennobled or honored who? The Muslims? The children of Adam, which is not restricted to any particular religion. A human is dignified in the sight of Allah, at least on this earth, by virtue of being a human, nothing else. There is also the principle of universal justice and mercy. And the Quran makes it clear that one has to be judged, even just and reasonable and fair, even with people who do not share Islam, even with enemies. Don't let the hatreds of others to you, some understand it also, your dislike of others, prevent you or dissuade you from doing justice, do justice for this is closer to piety. As, as far as mercy is concerned, in Surah Al-Anbiya, the Quran sums up the essence of the message of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, save as mercy to whom? To Muslims? Yeah, there are some ayat. It says, وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ On one level, mercy to the believers. But it is also in this particular ayah says, لِلْعَالَمِينَ To the worlds in plural. Worlds which include human beings, 
Muslims and people of other faith, mercy to the world of animals, the world of vegetation, the world of ecology, even physical world, these are all included because the Quran does not say lil alam. We didn't say we sent you as mercy to al alam, alameen in plural, which includes all, including the alam or world of jinn, as the Quran speak about the jinn who listen to the Quran and they accepted also the message of all of the prophets. Fourthly, when the Quran speak about just and peaceful coexistence with others, it presumes that you must be living with others, other than Muslims. And the ayah is quite clear. لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقصتوا إليهم. Now, which means basically that Allah does not forbid you from being kind and just. It's more than kindness and more than justice, but there is no time to elaborate on that particular issue. The, the original Quranic term implies more than justice and more than mercy even, or compassion. Anyway, that you should deal with them in kindness and justice, so long as they are not fighting you in, because of your religion or driving you out of your homes, i.e. committing aggression or oppression. They are entitled to this. Well, this ayah we know, but there is an implication for our topic here that it presumes that you're not living always with Muslims because you're required to treat others who are not Muslims. The ayah deals with people who are not Muslims even because, of course, you feel obligated to be just and kind with your own faith community, but that goes beyond even the parochial type of kindness and justice. Fifthly, when the Quran speaks not only of the brotherhood of faith, which is, of course, one element, but on another macro level also, the Quran in many ayahs, many verses, speaks about brotherhood of the whole of humanity. Of course, the most oft-repeated ayah in the Quran is the 13th ayah in Surah Al-Hujurat, the 49th surah. Okay. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ Now, if you look at the free translation, O oh, humankind, so the address is not only given to Muslims. O oh, humankind, we created you male and female or from a single pair of a male and female and we made you into nations and tribes that you may get to know and recognize one another. And then when it says, Inna akramakum, the most honored of you, who are those people meant by you? Since the address is to the whole of humanity, then you also applies to the whole of humanity. The most honored of you as humans, even in the sight of Allah, is one who is most Allah conscious. So that presumes, that ayah in itself implies that you're living also with people other than your own community. So that's part of civic engagement as well. But beyond this broad concept, and you could add more and more, just selected ones, let us move to the third issue, uh, which is the directives that are more explicit even than broad concept. Broad concept is like the grounding, because without understanding the basic philosophy, the basic concepts and background, we cannot speak about, about anything that's more specific. So the purpose of that third section of the four section paper is to examine those direct commands that are even unarguable, that you should not isolate yourself from the community where you're living as a basic rule. Number one, the Quran calls on Muslims to cooperate with all, not only with other Muslims. If you look at the first ayah or second ayah in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the fifth surah, what does it say? وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى It doesn't say, which means cooperate, meaning with all in things that are righteous and pious. The address here is not only to Muslims, otherwise the ayah would have qualified. It would have said وَتَعَاوَنُوا مَعَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ or with مَعَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ It didn't say cooperate with Muslims or with believers, which is an open invitation to cooperate with all with the qualification that it is not cooperation in sin and anything that is forbidden by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only in righteous and acceptable deeds. 
Secondly, to remove any doubt that this address is to the whole of humanity and to de in dealing with all the rest of humanity, the Prophet وسلم, was a party to a pact that took place in the pre-Islamic days. It is known as Hilf al-Fudul or Pact of Chivalry. The basic idea behind it was that to agree that if anyone is oppressed, even if he's a stranger visiting Mecca, then everybody, especially the chiefs of the tribe, should go to the oppressor and force him to do justice to that person. Something that is fully compatible, not only with righteous, moral, and ethical standards, but fully compatible with Islam as well. But that pact took place before Islam, before the mission of the Prophet وسلم, before the receipt of the first revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, after even prophethood, and after he received the ultimate standards and the best divinely revealed standards for justice, he still says that this pact is most beloved by me. And if it is invoked today, that's significant. It didn't say now the Quran is sufficient. It has the best standard of justice. So why do we invoke a pre-Islamic or Jahili pact? The Quran superseded that. He didn't say that even. If even that pact that I was party to, even before Islam, is invoked, if somebody says, by virtue of that agreement, we ask you to come with us to do justice. He said, I will respond to that. This is quite significant about the openness of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course, we all believe that the Quran supersedes everything. Yes, but he wanted to teach us also that even if that agreement was or is with other people other than Muslims, and it is righteous, it is good, you can actually respond to that. In your own motives, your motives is from the Quran. In, in terms of your own contractual obligation, being party to that agreement, that's fine also without diminishing your beliefs about the finality and superiority of the word of Allah over any agreement of other human beings for that matter. The third point is that in the early days of Islam, even in the Meccan period, some people who reverted to Islam, I know the word revert could be controversial, but still to me it's better than convert. We convert seem to indicate changing nature. Revert mean to me to go back to the pure innate nature, not to go back to bad habits as some people define it, to go back to the, your pure innate nature a statement that I hear and heard from many reverts who accepted Islam all over the world through my extensive travels, and they almost uniformly say that when we understood the true message of monotheism of Islam and its true teaching, we felt that we were Muslims already with, without realizing it. They say without even thinking a second time about what we were told to believe in, or somehow held it, we had some doubts that was, were all removed when we accepted it. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in this blessed gathering, the rivers to Islam, have felt the same way. I, I heard it consistently in various countries. So that's just a, a side remark about why I prefer still to use the term river, those who are coming to their true innate nature of Tawheed, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those three words at the time of the Prophet ﷺ were not told, don't go to this jahili, idol-worshipping communities, stay here in Mecca with other believers. Both in Mecca and Medina, he used to send them to their own people so that they can carry the message of their own people. To live among their people, the idolatrous people, among them so that they can convey the message of Allah to them, to their clans. Fourthly, that we are all aware that the first migration of the Muslims persecuted in uh, Mecca was not to Medina, it was to Abyssinia, today's roughly uh, Habasha or Ethiopia. And Ethiopia was under the rule of a Christian king, so it was a Christian country, a Christian community. Yet the Prophet وسلم, even praised him for his justice, that go to a country 
go to Abyssinia because there is a king there, a Christian king, where people are not oppressed in his reign or realm. So he's even praising someone who believes in something that is, is at variance in many significant points uh, from Islam, praising him. But what is more significant is that he did not say for, to them, for example, stay there only until we have an Islamic political system where we are free. And the evidence, the evidence is that many of those migrants to Abyssinia remained there and did not return to Medina, even after Medina city-state, as they call it, quote unquote, was established. They came later, even after, or at the time of Khaybar, which is in a later part even of Medina. If it is true, like some people mistakenly, in my humble view, think that it is wrong for Muslims to live among non-Muslim countries or among non-Muslim communities, except for absolute necessities like medication, education, or trade, they, that was not needed at that time. They, the Prophet وسلم, would have ordered Muslims to come immediately. You have no reason now. You're not oppressed anymore. We have a city state in Medina. So all of these are clear evidence, I believe, in direct uh, appeals or direct commands that you should, you could actually, at least you could. In some cases you should if there is some benefit to the ummah also. Now we come to the fourth issue, the final issue before the conclusion. With this conceptual background, with these apparently explicit commands that you could live among communities that are not Muslims. You don't have to always live among Muslims. Then we come to two issues of concern, the question of loyalty. And oftentimes when I travel, I heard it in Britain, I heard it in the US and other places, that Muslims are confronted with that question. And the brothers and sisters there ask me, how should we answer that question? Are you a Muslim first or American first? Are you a Muslim first or Canadian first? And the same, German, French, you name it. And they say, what answer should we give, yes or no? I said, neither yes nor no, because the formulation of the question itself is faulty. And if the question itself is wrong, then how do you give an answer to the wrongly formulated question in the first place? Why? Because to say, are you Muslim first or Canadian or American first, presumes that it is either or. Presumes that these are two contradictory and incompatible things. Either you become Muslim first or you become American first, which I believe humbly but firmly, it is totally false because of the presumption of that question. To start with, neither a, a devout Muslim, nor a devout Christian, nor a devout Jew, let alone possibly other religions as well, denies or say it with a straight face and with sincerity and courage that the ultimate authority in this whole universe is the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of all. I don't think that any devout person from any religion who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the universal God of all would say my loyalty to a given group of people or a given government supersede my loyalty to my creator. What is wrong with that? It is only wrong when a Muslim say that, not a Christian, if the same statement made by a Jew or Christian Nobody will find any problem or, or paradox with that. But only when a Muslim say that, no, no. You choose one or the other. And this is not only a matter of basic belief, especially among the three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, could be others. But it is also logical. Once you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has the infinite knowledge humans don't. Allah has the perfect wisdom. 
humans not. Allah is infinite. Human beings are finite. How could any sensible person, provided that he or she believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, says no, the finite supersede the infinite. The all wise should be superseded by the wisdom of human beings collectively or individually. Yes, we say it, and we say it with pride and with full conviction. We make no bones about it. We make no apology whatsoever on it. But let us look at the issue also from another perspective. Our loyalties inherently, always inherently contradictory? There may be some cases. Are they always mutually exclusive? It could arise in some cases, but it's not necessarily the case. Can a person have multiple non-contradictory, non-conflicting loyalties? Yes, indeed. You could be loyal to your family, loyal to your friends, loyal to your nation, and loyal to Allah at the same time. What's the problem with this? Why the presumption of contradiction? Thirdly, when we speak about loyalty to a nation, a country where you live, where you are citizen, we have to remember that any loyalty to any society is not identically with uncritically and blindly accepting some government policies, especially our government these days in Canada. Maybe other countries also can join in that. It's not identical. In fact, identity, uh, you know, loyalty to a given country is, does not mean loyalty to a particular government policies or to even people who are in power. And oftentimes even they are, uh, are Elect, you know, are not elected for the second period and people come with different policies. These are changing things. So the, it's loyalty to the country as a country, to its ideal, to its charter of right, for example, is much more important than loyalty to any government that has its own agenda, whether it's right-wing agenda, left-wing, or in-between agendas. Fourthly, when people hear I, I saw that in the United States happening, and I see it sometimes in Canada also happening, where a Muslim who opposes some rash and improper policies of his government, like ventures, wars, like occupation of Iraq, for example, and let's say it clearly, because this is an issue that neither Muslim nor sensible, fair-minded non-Muslim disagree upon. Invasion of another country, causing hundreds of thousands of fatalities, maybe millions of injuries, destroying the infrastructure of the country. At one time, when pe people objected to that as Muslims, they were condemned that they are not loyal to their country. Yet when a senator or somebody in Congress or another famous politician condemned the invasion of Iraq, no problem. What a double standard. The bottom line is this, that we're not only apologizing or saying that's okay, it should be treated the same, but we say it in the most positive and sincere way that opposition to the rash and erroneous decisions made by governments is loyal, is patriotic, and is democratic unless the term loyalty, patriotism, and democracy are only used hypocritically to apply to some, not to others. A fifth point, that there is nothing called unqualified and utterly absolute freedom or absolute concept of loyalty. In fact, the Quran does not call for absolute and blind loyalty to Muslims, even if they're wrong. When we read the ayah that we recited earlier in Surah Al-Ma'idah, cooperate with one another, with all Muslims and non-Muslims, in everything that's righteous and pious. But what comes next? وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ But never cooperate with whom? The address is for all. 
don't cooperate with non-Muslims, don't cooperate with Muslims if the act is sinful and wrong. Look at this beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. أنصر أخاك ظالما أو مظلوما قالوا يا رسول الله ننصره مظلوما فكيف ننصره إن كان ظالما قال بأن تمنعه من الظلم أو كما قال The meaning of the hadith here that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says that you should support your brother of course you can add and or sister we don't repeat it it's known based on the egalitarian address in the Quran to all support your brother whether he is oppressor or oppressed. So the companion of the Prophet وسلم, said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we, we know how we support our brother when he is oppressed. How can we support him if he is the oppressor? You know that question signifies something that you really need to think about it. Think about it. What kind of transformation took place of pre-Arabic Arab Muslims or pre-Arab or pre-Islamic Arabs, I should say. Transformation from the pre-Islamic era in the Jahiliyyah where loyalty to one's clan, loyalty to one's tribe or family supersede anything, anything. If the Elders of the tribe said, let's invade other people and plunder them or kill them. Everybody has to follow. And these were well-entrenched attitude among the pre-Islamic Arabs. Look at the transformation when now they totally changed their world vision. I cannot support my family, my clan, or my tribe if they're doing wrong. So the question is significant about this transformation. They wondered, how could we support an oppressor? Which they did all their lives before Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, you support him, or meaning, quote unquote, you support him by preventing him from being an oppressor. How many people in America, in Britain, for example, try to prevent their governments from being oppressive and occupiers in a military in ventures at the expense of the lives, property, and future of other people. Mind you, don't look at it optimistic, pessimistically. There were many. One of the largest demonstrations ever to condemn the invasion of Iraq, in spite of all the propaganda and misleading statements made by the politician leading to the war. Some people were innocently misled by the myth and myth MYTH information fed unto them by politicians and the supporting media. The largest of those demonstrations expressing their vehemence and following the Prophet وسلم, without realizing it, that they felt that the righteous thing to do is to try to prevent or stop the war against innocent people. That was a demonstration in London, England, with nearly two million people, a small minority of them were Muslims. They were following the Prophet without realizing it. This is the most noble and golden rule that Muslim has ever offered to this world. The sixth point, does that say that there is absolutely no situation whatsoever that could arise where a Muslim cannot compromise because what he's asked to do goes not against some interest of his or his family, but comes into contradiction with the core values that he or she holds dear. The best example of this would be if I tell you go and kill innocent people, participate in the invasion without justification of another country kill people, drop these bombs on people. Now, for any believer, and this is not only Quranic, it's biblical, that if you kill one single person without due right, it is like killing the whole of humanity. Saving one life is like saving the whole of humanity. And if a person says, no, I can't do that. Some non-Muslims did it. 
Some Muslims did it, like Muhammad Ali, you remember. And remember, even in the Vietnam War, they were ordinary people from various faith backgrounds. Remember, say, no, I will not go, or something of that nature. Or hell, no, I would not go. It's not because they were cowards, but they were people who have, at least many of them, I'm not saying 100%, many, if not most, that it went against their unconscious. Now, if I, as a Muslim, or Jew or Christian, for that matter, if I take my religion really seriously, is told to go and kill innocent people, which is tantamount even for each person to the whole of humanity, how could I meet my Lord in the day of judgment with the blood of innocent people in my hands? No apology for that. That is where I say no. But this has to be done legally. No treachery, no betrayal. Your refusal itself for a good cause is not betrayal. That's why there are many countries who have these conscientious objectors, like Muhammad Ali did and others. You can even resign. Don't say my benefit in the army or this. When it comes to that serious issue, there is no problem at all. You're still loyal. You're still democratic. And on top of that, you're more humane than those who order you to kill innocent people. Finally, more specifically, what are the duties and rights of citizens? And may I remind you, my dear brothers and sisters, of what was mentioned earlier, even going through the table of contents or outline. I deliberately put duties before rights. Oftentimes, the complaint is made that Muslim minorities always keep talking about their rights, their rights. Yes, they have certain rights. Yes, some of those rights are trampled upon with very silly and inappropriate excuses, like all this, uh, you know, red herring about a woman covering her face or covering her body. What a silly thing that politicians fall into and descend into. A piece of cloth is what's going to destroy the whole world, explode it. Subhanallah. So duties, but of course, yes, they have rights. Yes, they have every right to demand their legitimate rights so long as they're not hurting others. Not going against certain values in society that's against their own beliefs. Not being subjugated to a particular culture because even in any society there are multiples of culture. And no culture, including the dominant culture, has any right to impose its cultural practice on others. All should obey the law and all should be free to practice what they believe is right, so long as they don't encroach on the freedom of others. What kind of encroachment of the freedom of others if a sister chooses to have niqab? And why do we have politicians and others acting as the mufti general for Muslims by saying, but this by that? It is not the duty of politician, nor the duty of courts to make interpretation of the dogmas. This is not the charter of right. This is not the constitution of the United States. If a person believes in what he believes, that's it. But having explained the importance of looking at duties also, even first, number one, citizenship in a way is a contract. And the contract has two parties. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, awfu bil uqood. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, the first ayah. O believers, fulfill your contractual obligation. In praising the believers, the Quran says, وَالْمُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِهِمْ إِذَا عَهَدُوا Good believers are those who fulfill their contractual obligation. So there is an implicit contract, if not explicit even, by being a citizen that you have certain obligation as a citizen under the Constitution. Some, some laws might divert from the Constitution, and that's why you get challenges, for example, in the Supreme Court, both of the United States and Canada, for that matter. But it is a contract, and you have to fulfill it if they have no reason to. The third point is that in the Western world, or Muslim living in the Western world, might have known already, I'm sure everybody knows that, that if you look at the Constitution, or in Canada, the Charter of Rights, there is nothing there that tells you that you cannot fulfill your 
core responsibilities to Allah as a Muslim or Christian or Jew or anything that you may be. There are, yes, some imperfections, but these imperfections are largely, if not almost exclusively, in laws and regulation, not necessarily something embedded clearly in the Charter of Rights or Constitutions. Also, international law and various conventions, all of them guarantee religious freedom. So you have a strong and profound base in constitutions as well as international law that you practice your faith without intervention. Even the so-called secular society. You see, you have to distinguish between secularity, which a Muslim can live under that uh, in, in societies that do not have faith-based constitution, or even in some Muslim societies as it's happening today, where there is no other alternative but to live under that situation, to be inclusive of everybody. And when people or the great majority are convinced that the secularity should be modified, then this, this would be another issue. So secularity in a sense of not interfering with religions, positively or negatively, that's fine. You can live under that. But that's different from secularism. And I get unhappy with the word ism, you know, that attachment, you know, ism. Because when you talk about circular, uh, secularism, it becomes an ideology itself in itself. It's not as a means like security of achieving fairness and equality among people from different faiths by not supporting or opposing any religion. It becomes an ideology in itself, an ends rather than a means. And that is totally different from secular fundamentalism, which in some forms are just as fanatical, as extreme as religious fundamentalism, which has always got the title of fundamentalism. And the best examples we have, of course, we used to have in Tunisia, where it was almost like a crime to wear hijab, let alone niqab. We have seen it in Turkey, and the government is doing their best in a constitution that has been shaped, actually, to impose secularism rather than, or to impose what I call secular fundamentalism. It is the same with France and all this silly argument about women being denied their rights to education, their rights to jobs, their rights to going to public institutions simply because they have that piece of cloth on their, on their heads, which is more dangerous than the atomic bomb. And the greatest danger to the values of the French Republic, the republic that was claimed to have been based on freedom and fraternity and liberty. What kind of liberty and what kind of freedom is this? The fifth argument here about duties of the citizen is that in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that was signed by the Prophet Sallallahu when he and his companions were prevented from going to Hajj or Umrah. That treaty is most amazing when you look at it carefully because some of the provision in that treaty that the people of Quraysh and whoever comes into their alliance would be regarded as one party to that agreement. The other party to the agreement is the Prophet ﷺ, the Muslim community, and whoever comes also under the umbrella, their umbrella or alliance. Many people do not realize that among the people who were in the alliance with the Prophet وسلم, was the non-Muslim tribe of Banu Khuza'a. And the agreement said that if anyone attack the other, he's attacking all, just like international defense, mutual defense treaty today. If you attack any party or their allies, it is an attack on the other party and their allies, which meant, in fact, that Muslims were supposed to stand up even having to go to the battlefield if Banu Khuza'a, non-Muslim Banu Khuza'a, are unfairly attacked by the other side. Which implies to us that today even, if anybody is attacking a country unjustly, whether it's Canada, United States for Muslims living in minorities, or European countries, 
if somebody really is attacking them without any due right, Muslims will be as obligated to stand up for the defense of the country, even though it's not a Muslim country, just as the Prophet وسلم, and Muslims were obligated to stand for the defense of the non-Muslim tribe of Banu Khuzar. The just and peaceful coexistence that we talked about and the underlying hundred infinite number of lines under just, not coexistence. Many people talk about peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. And some countries speak about peace, but they spell it P-I-E-C-E. -E. They take one piece of land after one piece of land after one. This, they must be interested in pieces, not just one piece. Peaceful and just coexistence and cooperating with all is there. Again, to emphasize, if you object to something, you don't betray, you don't commit treachery, you don't shoot people in the back. That is wrong and un-Islamic. And finally, my final message, my final message, when we speak about civic engagement, is this, positive integration without isolation or assimilation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all to realize, fulfill, and promote our understanding. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.